Okay, if you're absent today and you're watching this later on today, uh, I apologize for not getting the recording started earlier. I had some other recording going on simultaneously. So we're looking at number 45 here. And the bottom line here is now we can calculate b squared minus 4ac. Um, go ahead and calculate that. Have you got it? Okay, I'm asking you to calculate it, please. think of 24. I'm seeing some nods. So 24. Now we just have to simplify this. Root 24 can be rewritten as root 4 root 6 or 2 root 6. Basic kind of math 10 idea. If I replace the root 24 with 2 root 6, then I can factor a 2 out of the numerator here and cancel the 2 that I factor out with a 2 that's a factor of the denominator. Or you want to take the shortcut, wipe a 2 out of the 4, out of the 2 root 6, and out of the 4. Um, I don't like relying necessarily on shortcuts. I think the concept of factoring and canceling is a hugely important, if that English is okay, it's hugely important in math. That's how you cancel, you cancel factors. So we're left with x equals two plus or minus root six all over two. Because what's happening here is this four on the denominator is a two times a two. So these pairs of, that pair of twos goes away. Uh, so anyway, you can see now what the answer is. A is two, B is six, C is two. Yep. That is for the x intercepts. Of the original function. Correct. Which are the y intercepts of the inverse. So that's the answer to the question. Hannah. Absolutely. To this point? Good. You're welcome. I'll just leave that frozen on the right-hand screen. For Are you good? Okay. Other questions? Yep. Okay. All right, so in question 41, you have a function g of x, which is a transformation of f of x. This language is important. What, what the phrase g of x is a transformation of f of x means is f of x is an original function that something is done to to get g of x. So how can we change f of x into g of x. And this illustrates an important idea that you're likely to encounter on the unit exam or the diploma exam. And if there's no diploma exam, I don't know if there will or won't be. But if there isn't, you're likely to encounter it on our school final. That you can arrive at a destination, in this case g of x, in multiple different paths. So first of all, I suppose we could go through all of these choices and test them. But I hope you can appreciate that if I reflect this blue graph vertically, I get the red graph. If I take this point, which is on the x-axis and reflect it vertically, it doesn't go anywhere. This point will go here. This point will go here. Sorry, this point will go here. It's a vertical reflection. There's no question about it. Just by inspection, you can see that there is a vertical reflection. And it's not a horizontal reflection. If I were to reflect this original function f of x horizontally, then this point would be invariant. 
This point, which is three to the right of the y-axis would be here. This point, which is four to the left would be here. And we would end up with that graph, okay? I'm doing that because we've eliminated C and D. I'm doing that because that's gonna be needed to explain which of these is also valid. Do you appreciate everybody that both of A and B, the second choice, what's circled in green, involves a horizontal reflection? Okay. What would I have to do to this green graph, which is the blue one horizontally reflected, to make it fit the red graph, which is what I want? Well, I would have to shift it four to the left. So if I take this function and I use b equals negative 1, I will get the green function. And then if I use h equals negative 4, I will get the red function, which is what I'm after. Okay? And that means that g of x is f of b times x minus h which is that. I wrote that, Ian, because I didn't want you to pick this one because this f of negative x plus 4 is not a shift of 4 to the left. You would have to factor the negative 1 out of that x plus 4 and you would get this. So choice A is actually a shift of four to the right. Conversely, if you multiply this negative one through, you're gonna get this choice. So the answer is B. You're welcome. Other questions? Yep. 24, certainly. So this is all related to, I don't know on what page it is, but you're given this graph and you're asked to use this graph for all this whole boatload of questions. What is the largest value of x in, this, in the domain of this new function? So if you take a look at a, b, h, and k, and, and maybe I should back up and explain that since we're after the domain of this new function, and we're given the original graph, we have to figure out what's happening to the original graph to get the new graph. So we can see what the domain is. A is clearly negative two, B is two, K is one. You're okay with those three parameters, Marcel? Now, in terms of H, this is this thing that, Man, you just don't want to get burned on this. You need to, to see H, factor B out. And if I factor 2 out of 2X, I'm left with X. And if I factor 2 out of 5, I'm left with 5 halves or 2.5. Remember when you factor, you're dividing by the thing you factor out. So if I take 5 divided by the 2 I factor out, I'm left with 2.5 or 5 halves. And then, of course, although it doesn't matter for this question, we also have we also have plus one. And I had this discussion yesterday. I, it might have been this question. It might have been a different question. It really doesn't matter. But this is, I think, important for this question. Since you're asked about the domain, the domain is a reference to the minimum and maximum values of x in this case. So the fact that this original graph is reflected vertically and stretched vertically by a factor of two doesn't change the domain in any way. Right now the domain is from negative four to four and, and it's going to be confined in between those two values of x, including them, until we stretch it horizontally or shift it horizontally. And I suspect that you've already 
kind of got the answer to the question, but I'm going to finish anyway. So this and this is not relevant to the question about the domain. However, since B is 2, we have a horizontal stretch by a factor of a half. And since H is 2.5, you know, this is a numerical response question, so why don't I just use decimals? 2.5, there is a shift of 2.5 units to the right. We're asked for the largest value of x in the domain. Well, if I go from a domain that is negative 4 to 4, and I stretch things horizontally by a factor of a half, this is going to become negative 2 and 2, and then I shift everybody this 2.5 units to the right. This is going to be 0 0.5 comma 4.5, so the answer is 4.5. Does that do it for you? Okay. I, I, I want to make up a question now, a different question. that is very important for your exam for tomorrow. And I don't know that there's something like it in your unit handout, review handout. What if I said, what is the range of, I'll just make one up, y equals negative 3, f of 2x plus 1 uh, plus 1. Okay, So the range. And, and there's something about this that's a little bit different than the domain one. And it has nothing to do with the fact that this is range and that's domain. It has to do with something else. So if you take the approach that I just kind of talked about, we take a look at our range currently. It's 1 to 3. The minimum value of y in that graph is 1. The maximum value of y in that graph is 3. And you say to yourself, well, since a is 3, a is equal to, well, a is negative 3, there's a vertical reflection, and there's a vertical stretch by a factor of 3. Again, I've mentioned this so many times, but I'll remind you, on a written response, you don't abbreviate things like this. You, you explain it in words. And then because k is 1, there's a shift of 1 unit up. Okay. So if I reflect something vertically, the y-coordinates get multiplied by negative 1. Correct? That's what happens to the y-coordinates. If I stretch them vertically, then these y-coordinates will also be multiplied by a factor of 3. And then I'm going to shift everything up 1, so I add 1 to negative 3 and get negative 2. I add 1 to negative 9 and get negative 8. But... This is incorrect. And there's a mistake I've made. And it's right here. This is the mistake. I've made a mistake that it's not a numerical mistake. It's a conceptual mistake. Does anybody know what the problem is? Think, think about this. I'm not asking you to necessarily grab onto the first thing that pops in your head. Like, what could conceivably be wrong here? And I'm kind of, it's a bit of a swindle because I'm telling you, well, y is multiplied by negative 1, and that's true. The old y of 1 does become negative 1, and the old y of 3 does become negative 3. But when I write this, that is incorrect. Marcel? Right. So... This should actually be written as negative 3, 1 because it's minimum to maximum. So when you have a reflection, 
This is what makes this range problem different than the domain one you asked about. There was no reflection with that one. When you have a reflection, if you just blindly say, well, I'm going to take the minimum y and multiply by negative 1, and then you're going to call that the minimum y, since it vertically reflects, the minimum becomes the maximum. So what we should be putting is negative 3 to negative 1. These numbers are just going to switch, basically. Right? We stretch it vertically by a factor of 3. That becomes negative 9, negative 3. We shift it 1 up. It becomes negative 8, negative 2. So just watch out for that. That's what I had written here on the sideboard uh, range reflection. And it doesn't always happen with range. It could happen with uh, domain, right? If you, if you flip it, remember your maximum becomes your minimum and your vice versa. Other questions? Okay, that's fine. Um, given the global importance in this unit of this, and your understanding of these parameters, I would say it's a safe bet that the written response will have a, a, a large component related to that. Okay, yes. 43? Certainly. So a quadratic function has the following properties. So we're going to dig back into Math 20 here to you know, kind of set the stage for this problem because you can't really answer questions about the square root of a function unless you have an idea of what it looks like. Okay, So we have a quadratic function where there's a maximum value. So that's an important, forgetting about the numbers here, Hannah, that's important because that tells us the parabola opens down. Okay, And it has two x-intercepts. So I, let's just take a quick peek at a sketch of this thing. And it's going to be a very rough sketch. It opens down. And it crosses the x-axis at 5 and 9. And this point is at 7, 12. I, it doesn't really matter where the y-axis is here, everybody, because we're asked for properties of the square root of that function. So this is also something that's I would recommend studying and making sure you understand all of the properties of square roots of functions for tomorrow's exam. This is where we say things like any place x, sorry, any place y equals 0 or 1 is invariant. So we're going to get, and, and I want to redraw this to, to make my life a little simpler. I'm going to draw it a little bit wider. Um, it's just going to make it easier for me to sketch the square root. So I've, I've changed my scale, and, and it's, it looks really stretched out, but it's still the same function. And this is at 7, 12. There will be an invariant point on the x-intercepts, because that's where y is 0. And there's going to also be an invariant point, this is not drawn to scale, wherever y is equal to 1. Okay, it's not drawn to scale, because this apparently is a y-coordinate of 12 at the top, and it doesn't look like 1 out of 12. And we know that over here, since the y-value is negative, we can't take the square root. And over here, the y-value is negative, we can't take the square root. We know that in between 0 and 1, when you take the square root, the value climbs, it goes up. But bigger than 1, it goes down. So what this graph will look like very approximately is that. I, you know, not as flat, but it will be curvy. You get the idea. So what are we asked for? Um, what's the domain? 
Well, the domain has to be from five to nine. And unless you pull together all of your resources from 20-1 with this information, it may not be obvious that's what the domain is. So the domain is D to E, which would be 5 to 9. And the range is 0 to some number. The, the, clearly the range is 0 up to some number. This number, and, and really this is not even remotely drawn to scale, will have a y value that's the square root of this y value. So it's going to go up to whatever the square root of 12 is. And now we have to, so this is from 0, we're, we're after this number, right? Now we have to reach back into grade 10 and 11 kind of thing and go, well, this is root 4, root 3. And root 4 is 2, so 2 root 3. The range is from 0 to 2 root 3. So g is 2 and h is 3. Um, just make a note, if, if this were a written response question and I just said determine the range, and you wrote 0, that can't be right and you wrote 0 to 3.46, I would mark it wrong. It's not 3.46. It's 0 to 2 root 3, which is an irrational number. Since it's irrational, I don't want to get too far off topic here, but since it's irrational, those decimals go on forever with no pattern or repetition to them. So you cannot express the value in a decimal form. No matter what you write, I don't care if you write a million decimals, it's not 2 root 3, because there's more that you can't write. Anyway, does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Shazmida. Eight? Yeah. This is all about transformations, but they're given to you verbally not mathematically in terms of A, B, H, and K. So what we're going to do is walk through this line by line and extract the value of A, B, H, and K. A graph of f of x is reflected in the x-axis. Okay. Now again, I recommend with reflections in axes that you stop and think very carefully. If I reflect something in the x-axis, that means things that are up top go below and vice versa. It's a vertical reflection. And what that's told me is that things are, well, I'll just say reflected vertically. Given Shesmaida and everybody that I'm asked to determine what happens to this point, I don't know that I need to write out what A is. Because ultimately, even if I knew what A was, I would then, as a next step, say, well, what does that do to the graph? It reflects it vertically. A, by the way, is a negative number. Um, it's stretched vertically about the x-axis by a factor of a third. You know, again, with the parameters, which I don't think are really helpful here, putting those two ideas together tells us that A is negative 3. Are you okay with that idea? But again, uh, not to beat the horse to death here, but... If I figure out that A is negative 3, all that's important is this, right? I, I, I take that A value and I go, what does that do? It reflects it vertically and it stretches it by a third. Uh, it's stretched horizontally about the y-axis by a factor of 4. Uh, by the way, that would mean, and it's not relevant to this question directly, that B would be 1 quarter. Does that make sense? Can you repeat your question, please? What did I write? Oh, I wrote negative 3. Wow. I'm sorry. Yes, it's negative 1 third. Sorry, I hope that didn't cause confusion. We've got it fixed now. Um, because the vertical stretch factor is the value of A. Okay. Um, 
Ultimately, what we're going to do, though, and I don't think you need to do mapping here, Shazmida. I think you just need to look at this point and say, if I reflect it vertically, what happens to it? So if I reflect this point vertically, it's going to go from negative 3, 6, and it's going to turn into negative 3, negative 6, isn't it? Okay. If I stretch things vertically by a factor of a third, then that means the y-coordinate is also going to be multiplied by a third or you know, divided by 3, and that negative 6 is going to further transform into negative 2. So now we're at negative 3, comma, negative 2. And then what else do we have here? We have a horizontal stretch by a factor of 4, and that means that x-coordinate of negative 3 is going to be multiplied by 4, and we're going to get negative 12, comma, negative 2. And that would give us an answer of D, correct? Okay. Is that okay? okay. Other questions? Yeah. 10? So number 10 asks about invariance. It, it asks about a point that doesn't move. And we have a number of transformations th that I'm going to run through. First of all, everybody, translations. If I take a graph and I shift it left or right or up or down, the concept of an invariant point is not welcome in that idea. It doesn't exist because by definition everything moves. So when do we get invariant points? We get invariant points when we have reflections stretches, and ultimately, you know, to summarize this nicely, the only, well, there's another one too, and square roots of functions. With reflections and stretches, the invariant points lie on the line of reflection or stretch. We haven't, I think I've only done this once with you. When you talk about a stretch, there is a line that you're stretching relative to. So a vertical stretch stretches things relative to the x-axis. So what I'm saying is, if you have a point on the x-axis and things are stretched vertically, since that point is on that line, that you're stretching relative to, it doesn't move. If I reflect things, to run through even more details here, if I reflect things vertically, then anything on the x-axis doesn't move. It's invariant. If I reflect things horizontally, then anything on the y-axis doesn't move. And if I reflect things across the line y equals x, which is an inverse function, any point on the line y equals x will be invariant. Correct? The ones that are invariant here are where y equals 0 or where y equals 1 because the square roots of those y values still give you those same numbers. So from that standpoint, if I reflect this point in the line y equals x, it will move because this point is not on the line y equals x. If it were, it would be something like 4, 4 or 0, 0. Another way, Adrian, we could eliminate this, A, is to recognize that A is talking about an inverse, and an inverse is found by swapping x and y, and if you swap these x and y numbers of 4 and 0, you're going to get a different point. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, if I reflect it in the y-axis, well, sometimes it helps. I, I know I talk a lot about you should be able to do this conceptually, but let's look at where that point is. Where does that point land on the grid? 4, 0 is here, right? So if I reflect it in the y-axis, I think you can see quite clearly this point is going to go over to the other side. It's going to move. So it's not 
B, a vertical stretch in the x-axis is going to be invariant because when I stretch things vertically, points that are above the x-axis get further or closer to the x-axis. Points that are below the x-axis get further or closer. But points on the x-axis, since they're on the line of stretch, don't move. Uh, if I horizontally stretch this in the y-axis, then it's going to get further or closer to the y-axis. Have I answered your question? Okay, good. Other questions? Yeah, Ian? Okay. Well, the only other thing I will say then is, and this might be an idea for, for other people as well, you know, if you want, you could put numbers in for A, B, C, and D here and use your graphing calculator. You would just have to make sure to put numbers in that match the parameters that you're told. So you could use negative 2 for A, B is positive, so I don't know. Why make it complicated? One. Uh, B is positive. C is negative, so you have X minus negative 3. And then D is positive plus 5. And you could graph that on your calculator and find out where the vertex is. I think that's kind of a... I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's a less sophisticated way of doing it. It's a little bit clunky. And then you could look at the domain. Uh, we had C is negative 3, so you would find out whether it's greater than or equal to negative 3 or less than or equal to negative 3. Other questions? Yeah. 40? This goes back to what I talked about a little bit earlier about having a destination. You want to get to a function, but there's different ways you could do that. And parabolas are interesting this way because if you take a look at the parabola y equals x squared, y equals x squared looks like this. Now let's just say I wanted to, we'll get back to this question in a second, but let's say I wanted to take that parabola and turn it into this parabola. Forget about this question. And I asked you to go from the green to the red. What are we doing to the green function? And Dua said, oh, well, we're stretching it horizontally by a certain factor. You can see it's, it's pulled away horizontally, the, the green one to get the red one. But somebody else could say, well, no, I'm going to stretch it vertically by a factor, by squishing it vertically down. And that's what this question is about. If I stretch this horizontally by a factor of 3, what is that equivalent to in terms of a vertical? Well, if we stretch it horizontally by a factor of 3, Arissa, right? Okay. Arissa, if we stretch it horizontally by a factor of 3, that means we have a B value of a third. And what that means, I'll go over here where you can see it, is that the new function will be f of one-third x. But since f of x is x squared, the new function is one-third of x squared. And we're almost going back to, I don't know, day two maybe, where I made a big deal of the fact that this means that, right, in this question. But y equals one-third of x quantity squared can be simplified by squaring the one-third and squaring the x and getting y equals, well, one squared is one, three squared is nine, x squared. But this is f of x, which means although the new function is y equals one-third of x, f of one-third of x, the new function can also be written as one-ninth 
of f of x. So I've taken that b value of a third, and by applying the function to it, I get an a value of a ninth. So it turns out that stretching that green graph, y equals x squared horizontally by a factor of 3, and stretching it instead vertically by a factor of a ninth, accomplish the same thing. Does that answer it? Good. Other questions? Thirty-two? Thirty-six. Very, very similar to that one yesterday where we went from f of x to g of x to h of x. Here, what's happening is we're going from f of x to the square root of something. But let me just tear this down bit by bit. I'm going to break it into pieces. If I said to you y equals f of x goes to y equals negative 2 f of x plus 8 and asked you about the properties of the new graph, you could figure it out. So I'm asking you right now, everybody, to ignore the square root. And I'm saying that to go from the original function to what's under the square root, you have to reflect it vertically, stretch it vertically by a factor of 2, and then add 8 to it. Okay. If I then, and let's just call this g of x. Let's just say this is g of x. If I said to you, we're now going to go from y equals g of x to y equals the square root of g of x, do you see that the square root of g of x is the graph or the equation we're actually asked about? Okay. So do we know, everybody, what happens to f of x to turn it into negative 2 f of x plus 8? Yes. Vertical reflection, vertical stretch by a factor of 2, shifting up 8. Do we know what changes occur when we go from a function like g of x to the square root. Yes, the y-coordinate gets square rooted. So if we layer these two transformations or sets of transformations on top of each other, that means that a point on the original function is going to turn into, on g of x, x comma negative 2y plus 8 because we're going to multiply y by negative 1 to reflect it. We're going to stretch it by a factor of 2, so we have to double it. We're going to shift it up 8. But then if we go to the third one, which is the one that we're interested in, you know that this turns into x comma root y. Now, you know, this is the tricky thing. This y here that I've got at the bottom of the page is not the actual y coordinate. This is the y coordinate, negative 2y plus 8. So the next step would be to take the square root of it. I think I just said negative 2x plus 8, and I meant to say negative 2y plus 8. So the bottom line is, if you want to take a mapping approach, that's the case. If you don't, then think of it this way. So you don't have to do all this. Do you agree that in terms of order of operations, the first thing that happens to the function is it's multiplied by negative 2, then 8 is added, and then you take the square root? Okay. So if I stretch this vertically by a factor of 2 and reflect it vertically, it becomes 3 comma 10 correct? If I shift it up 8, it becomes 3 comma 18. And if I take the square root of the function, which is y, it becomes 3 comma root 18. And I believe we're just after the y coordinate, right? So whatever the square root of 18 is, 4 point whatever. You know, I'll make a note to you that the x-coordinate in this question doesn't change because every transformation, vertical stretch, vertical reflection, and 
square rooting a function affects only y. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Certainly. Um, okay, so what I would tell you is I don't think you would ever have to worry about solving this algebraically. Okay? It, what's going to happen here, and I didn't teach you Math 20, so I don't, I don't know what your Math 20 teacher did with this. I'll show you the brief introduction to the algebraic method, and then we'll talk about getting the answer. What you would have to do would be to square both sides. And when you square the left-hand side, what you're going to get is x plus 5. And when you square the right-hand side, <laughs> you have to recognize that the square of that thing is root 7 minus x plus 1 times root 7 minus x plus 1. You're going to have to FOIL that out. So I'm going to get root 7 minus x times root 7 minus x, which is this. I will have outer is plus 1 root 7 minus x. Inner is plus another 1 root 7 minus x. So I get two of them. And last is 1. Then you're going to have to rinse and repeat here, so to speak. I'm going to have to isolate the radical now that I'm still left with. So I will have 2 root 7 minus x equals, let's see, x plus the x that I move over is 2x. I have 7 plus 1, which is 8. If I take 8 away from 5, I have this. I think that's okay. Yep. And then you're going to repeat the process. And that's where I'm going to, well, I'll do one last step here. You would have to square the 2 and square the square root. I'm not going to FOIL this out, but you would have, well, I'll write it out. You'll have 4x squared minus 12x plus 9 when you FOIL it out. And then you're going to solve that. But remember that the only reason why you would be expected to solve these algebraically is to find extraneous roots. I'm going to tell you that you would never be given a question about extraneous roots where you have to do this twice. So. Uh, what you would do is solve it with your graphing calculator. Is that okay? Okay. I need to take another quick break here. Just give me one minute. Take a look and see if you have any more questions. Go ahead, Leslie. Did you say 27 or 37? 37? So what is the domain of the square root function if the function is 9 minus x squared? What this boils down to, and it's a very important concept for tomorrow's exam, everybody, is that when you take the square root of a function, the new function will only exist wherever the old function was equal to 0 or greater than 0. And when I say, everybody, the old function, I mean the y coordinates, because the function is y. In other words, if I gave you the following situation, and I said to you, what is the, that's f of x, and I said to you, what is the domain of y equals root f of x? Root f of x will be defined here. It will be defined here. And it will be defined everywhere in between those two points because everywhere in between has a positive y coordinate. And 
at the two points, it has a zero y coordinate, and you're allowed to take the square root of zero or positives. It will also be defined here because you can take the square root of that y coordinate, and it will be defined everywhere to the right of there because everywhere to the right, y is positive on the original. So the domain of the new function would be in this particular case. By the way, what I've drawn in green, that's not the square root function. That's just a, a, a communication to you of what the domain is. To get the new function, you would have to do more work. Anyway, the domain would be x is everything from an including negative 8 up to an including positive 10, as well as anything greater than or equal to 14. So when it comes to this question, much like another question we did, you need to reach back into previous math topics to know what this looks like. I mean, could you graph it on your graphing calculator? Sure, but if I gave you something like this on a written response, it wouldn't be something you could put in your calculator. So we know what y equals x squared looks like, right? It's a parabola that opens up with its vertex at the origin. y equals negative x squared. There's a negative in front of the x squared would open down. Negative x squared plus the 9 would be a parabola that is up here at 9 on the y-axis and opens down. Pretty lousy parabola that I drew, but you get the idea. So first of all, the domain of this is not going to be two separate pieces. The domain is going to be from an including this x-intercept up to an including this x-intercept. We just need to find the x-intercepts. Well, I mean, it's B. I don't even, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious what the x-intercepts are. But it can't be D because D doesn't include the numbers. It has to be from a number, including that number, up to and including another number. But if you wanted to find the x-intercepts, you take the function, You set y equal to 0. Lots of ways to solve this. You might factor it as a difference of squares. Anyway, you can see that x equals 3 or negative 3. Is that helpful? OK, good. Other questions? Go ahead, Ian. OK, give me a second to get there. So how come D is not correct? Okay. So D says we're going to go from 2 to infinity. First of all, do you understand, Ian, that this question is not asking you which of the choices will produce a function. It's asking you which will not. Okay. So from a very general standpoint, when we take an inverse of a graph, everybody, up, down, turns into right, left. And any time you have a graph that goes to the right and then back to the left, or vice versa, it's not a function. So that means any part of this graph that goes down and up is not going to be a function when you find the inverse. So if we take a look at negative 6 to 4, if we take a look at negative 6 to 4, negative 6 to negative 4, that piece goes up and down. Yes? So the inverse of that will not be a function. Please tell me the answer is A. Okay. So right away we've stumbled onto the answer because, again, this, these ones where it's which one is not are, are tricky, but this one is not going to be a function. So that's the correct answer. If we were to take a look at B, 
B is from negative 4 to negative 1. Negative 4 to negative 1 only goes down, which means the inverse will only go to the left. This will be a function making it an incorrect choice. If we take a look at C, C is from negative 1 to 2, Well, that only goes up. Made a straight line for me, but it's curvy, but it only goes up. And finally, if we look at D, which is the one you were wondering about, what color do I need? Green, I suppose. This, whoops, only goes down. And I suppose I understand where you're coming from, that you're just assuming it's going to turn around and come back up. Any important features of graph, in, including change of direction, would have to be shown on the graph. So when, you know, it, it's kind of like you saying, was that your thinking that it's going to come back up? It's kind of like us saying, well, if you have a parabola, is it going to keep going like that? No, there's no reason for us to think it's going to change direction radically. It, it continues on with that kind of curviness to it. Is that good? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so you got about uh, 10, 15 minutes left here where you can work on some more of these problems or work on that extra, extra practice stuff. If you wanted that handout, I'll put them out here again. Um, as well as doing math, I think it's important that you study. You study the, the properties of square root functions. You go over all of the formulas that we've learned in terms of A, B, H, and K and stretch factors and all of that. Uh, you want to write this exam tomorrow and get off on a good foot. The, the goal, my goal, is always in this course that nobody at the end of this exam is going to require a rewrite because there are tougher beasts to slay later on than transformations. Logarithms and exponents, two trig exams, those are the three big ones. All right, uh, get to work. I'll, I just have to stop my recording for this class and then I'll come around and I'll give you a hand if you need it.